Welcome to the services of worship at First United Methodist Church of Waukesha on this, the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. I'm delighted that you've chosen to join us this morning. This morning, if you're a guest with us, I look forward to the opportunity to meet you down the road. I'm sure you'll find the people of First Church to be a welcoming people and a people who want their faith to make a difference in the community. If you'd like to make an offering to First Church this morning, I would invite you to go to our webpage, fumcwaukesha.org, and find the PayPal portal and to leave your offering there. Or if you'd rather write a check and drop that in the mail, we invite you to do so. Today, the scripture is our call to worship. It calls us to a newness. It calls us forward with respect to the currency of grace in the Christian community and the way we live that grace out in our economics and ethics in the world. This morning, our passage is from the 20th chapter of Matthew verses 1 through 16. Listen now, if you will, for the Spirit to speak. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Here ends the scripture today.
May we be in prayer for the church and for the world. God of morning glories and pumpkin vines, Lord of the day and hope of tomorrow, we give you thanks for your presence in each moment. We give thanks for the gift of now, the address of your lingering and the constant journeying that calls us forward. Thank you for the gift of the church, the body of Christ, the form for the poetry of being human and sustaining our faithfulness. Above all, we give thanks for the moral arc of your kingdom toward love and justice. O oh God, move us to walk with you and if need be, carry us there in ways that leave no one behind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of creation, your planet has long told us the consequences of our failure to live in proportion with each other. Each storm, each fire is the immune system of a world being harmed. Grant us mercy, we who are in harm's way, and grant us wisdom to be more faithful than we have ever been. Make us good stewards of these days. Holy One, we give thanks for the neighbors you have given us to love. O oh God, we pray for the man who spends the length of his days on our benches on Park Avenue. Give him direction and solace when efforts to communicate fail us. Grant our neighbors peace. May the music that comes from our building bless and sustain this neighborhood. Thank you. For the other churches in the community lifting us in prayer today. We lift to you, Pastor Greta, and pray that her vacation will be renewing and the time away offer perspective and wisdom. Thank you for the company of the committed at First Church, praying, visiting, calling, serving, and broadcasting this service of worship. May each of us, O oh God, meet you in our service. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift to you Mary and Frank Hedgecock moving to Minnesota. We thank you for their long years of faithfulness here with Mary serving on the staff team and their witness as a couple here and in the community. Give them to know your guidance and wisdom as they follow you in this next phase of life. We pray for the bishops of the church, given so many challenges while so many clergy are suffering. We pray for the guests to this service of worship. May something in the music or the moments of reflection whisper your love and calling to serve. 
Today, we especially pray for many of the couples at First Church facing chronic illness and transitions and seasons of increased caregiving. We lift to you Joan and Bill Donnell, Marlon and Linda Herman, Frank and Grace McNabb, Betty and Bill Zickow, and Mary and Tom Taft. Give them to know your peace as they navigate the well-being that is possible in their lives. Lord, I pray for Julie Warther and I as we anticipate our own wedding next Sunday. Thank you for the second chances you give us in life and your clear guidance in our days. Oh God, may our love bear witness to your never-failing mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift to you those dealing with the coronavirus, Tarek and Laurel Alizad, Reverend Bill Bush, Reverend Antonio Manriquez, and the Reverend Carlos Sandoval. Thank you for the healing experienced on our church staff and for the ways your love raises health care workers who bear witness to your magnificent resilience among us. God of the still small voice, speak to us now in the silence. Those things you would have us hear. Help us accept each other in ways that make your love known. Lord of the universe, heal us of the racism that is destroying lives in this land. And in all things, Good Shepherd, teach us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said the last will be first and the first will be last. That God does not rank us according to some category of value. God does not differentiate in value the way God would regard us. The last will be first, the first will be last. Is another way of saying that Jesus reveals a God who is relentlessly committed to treating us with the solidarity of equals. Chapter 20, the text that we're working out of today and, and listening to in our life of faith, follows a, a segment of teaching in 19 about what Warren Carter calls against the grain households. Jesus was trying to raise up a body of people who lived against the grain with respect to the ethics of that time. Against the grain households, if you'll remember, value children, value women in ways the ancient Near East did not value women, valued people in their dealings with each other according to the grace of the gospel. And in chapter 20, the against-the-grain households are encouraged to go out into the world with their economics and ethics to challenge the world, to be a, a light to the nations, to the world with respect to our ethics and economics. The best way that I can uh, uh, explain the last will be first and the first will be last parable in the text today is my vast knowledge of church potluck suppers. In the beginning, I took classes. I tried to take classes in potluck suppers. I, I, I've tried to do immersion experiences uh, in potluck suppers. 
And I was thinking as this parable unfolded in my mind about the XYZ extra years of zest, our seniors group, and how they always had pre-pandemic, always had a potluck supper the second Thursday at noon. And that was a chance to get acquainted and visit with people. And often I would go at the end and I would say, oh, so smugly, oh, because the last will be first and the first will be last. And I felt so smug, so good, so Methodist about being last. And as I thought about those potluck suppers, it never failed that by the time the last soul, that poor last hungry soul got in line, there was always enough. In particular, the very first dish, Joan Sampson's meatballs. There was all, the, the whole church went through the line and they left me three of Joan Sampson's meatballs. There's always meatball enough for the soul who went last. Jesus is trying to raise up a people who look after the people who go behind them. So there's a parable told today. Jesus tells a parable about the kingdom of God. Other translations could be the governance of God, the realm, the reign, the way of God, the empire of God, if you will. The way God deals with us is in this unfolding, a parable that Jesus tells about a vineyard owner who is facing a harvest and goes out into the harvest at the first light at 6 o'clock in the morning to go and invite people from the marketplace where they would stand around, wait, hope for work. And if you were able to get a, a good job, a good paying job, would be a job that paid a denarius, one day's wage, a wage enough to feed your family. And he would offer those in the parable who came at six in the morning, a denarius, a living wage to work in the vineyard. And, and that owner would go back at nine o'clock and, and say again, because there was, there was harvest enough to, to invite, and people came from greater distances to, to see if they could get work to, to arrive by nine o'clock. They had to come from a farther distance into the marketplace. And the, and the crux of the text is when the owner says to the people who come later, I will pay you what is right. I will pay you what is right. But he doesn't say what is right. It's, we're left to the end to figure out, well, once you take out the taxes, what is right? So he goes again at 12 and at 3 and at 5 o'clock and he offers them the same to, to pay them what is right. And when the day's work is done, the, the payment is done and the, and the owner is up in front of, and begins with a sort of a reverse pageantry where the people who came last were paid first. And much to their surprise, they received enough to feed their families. Could you imagine the surprise of working at 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and to think, I received enough to feed my family. And so at 3 o'clock and at 12 o'clock and at 9 o'clock, but the people who came at 6 were thinking, wow, I'm sure I earn more. I deserve more than the others. But he, the old vineyard owner offered one denarius exactly what he agreed to pay them the same enough. And they grumbled. The very same verb used in the wilderness wandering about what it means to be human. The, 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 the human community grumbled because there was, there was no gradation. There was no separation according to value. There, it, there, there was no a, a, a respecter of those who came first. The first come, first serve was out the window. Grace is the currency of Christian community. And in the grumbling, it's hard for us to receive this notion that Jesus reveals a God who is relentlessly committed to treating us with the solidarity 
of equals. And yes, it calls our economics and our ethics into question. I didn't have to go far this week to look for sermon illustrations. Yesterday on NPR, I heard a report that NPR is reporting that now the children are back in school, that we are hearing that morbidity rates for children of color are higher than their peers. It wasn't enough that morbidity rates for adults of color were so much higher. Now, as a result of our ethics and economic policies, children of color are dying at a higher rate than their peers. What would it mean in this country to reestablish systems and economics and ethics where children of color would have enough to live? The very next report on NPR, I was in the line at the bank, the very next report on NPR was a whistleblower complaint. So, of course, it has to be looked into it. It gets its day in the halls of Congress. But a whistleblower complaint from immigration is reporting that women of color are receiving hysterectomies without their consent. They may be needed, but they were not engaged in their language. They were not engaged about their bodies. And they are getting hysterectomies without their consent. Our ethics in this country about persons of color are not Christian. We have a deep sense in this country about where people stack up in value. And Jesus came to save, to heal, restore the least and the last and the lost. What would it mean if the people who follow Jesus could practice against the grain ethics and economics? With respect to the pandemic, I had about 906 Zoom calls this week. And on one of those Zoom calls, I was privileged to be in a, a Zoom call with the leadership of the North Central Jurisdiction, some very, very, very gifted spiritual leaders. And as we were checking in, about how it's going in the Dakotas and Wisconsin and Ohio and different places, it became clear to me that we are in an endurance phase in this pandemic. And we're seeing the wear on people's faces. We're seeing the difficulty of facing the holidays, if you will, in the midst of this pandemic. In the midst of that Zoom call and seeing the wear on people's faces, I thought about this parable that calls us to have grace with each other. This is our first pandemic for each of us, unless you're Billy Byerline, this is our second. But we're all experiencing our first pandemic. And what if the Christian community lived with a currency of grace with each other? And maybe more clearly because grace Grace washes out when we, when we think about what does that word grace mean. But, but maybe if we think about it this way, maybe it's time to set aside our reactivity for receptivity to each other. Maybe if we could set aside our reactivity about each other, we would, we would have created a space for receptivity with each other. I'm reading the Waukesha Reads book, When the Emperor Was Divine, I would recommend it. And so far, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a story unfold about the children in Japanese internment camps. 
being carted off. And it reminded me that reactivity has desperate consequences. What if in this space and time of pandemic, we could set aside our reactivity and create room for receptivity with each other? And with the people who understand what a potluck is, maybe this is the time to leave meatball enough for your neighbor. Maybe these are the days in the midst of a pandemic to leave meatball enough for the people who go behind you. Maybe with our dealings with each other, with our ethics, our workplaces, in the schools, with educators, maybe this is the time to set aside meatball enough for each other. And on this Sabbath morning, on this Sunday, I would encourage you to begin with yourself. Have grace with yourself. Set aside meatball enough for yourself so that if you're able to taste grace and the healing of grace, if you're able to experience grace for yourself and to know the sweetness of its taste, you are more likely to offer meatball enough for the people who go behind you. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is sustaining the church with grace enough for us to live our mission. Thank God. Praise God. I believe our God is relentlessly committed to treating us with the solidarity of equals. I believe it's time to set aside our reactivity that we might offer receptivity to each other. And I believe it's time to set aside meatball enough for your neighbor. Thanks be to God. Amen.